All right. Uh, so let's begin with uh, um, building out our agenda. It's currently open, uh, uh, empty on the document, but uh, we have some leftover uh, items from our previous meeting with Daniel that we can uh, advance. Um, let's uh, going over that. We have the topic of ergonomic brand checks. Uh, is that something we would like to discuss this meeting? Um, Daniel, you are muted if you are speaking. I'm not, uh, for ergonomic brand checks, I guess, um, I'm, there, there were a bunch of different topics that we discussed, uh, so I'm not sure which one we should prioritize. Okay, so let's, um, well, let's put it on and then figure out what order it fits in relative to the others. Um, okay, so the other one was same key, um, which I think we've discussed briefly, but not to completion. Uh, the uh, reified names and what powers it should have. Uh, our records and tuples objects. We could continue to discuss that, I feel. Uh, there was the the one that came up during the meeting that I don't think was on the agenda last time, which was, uh, should we use a separate um, sort of expand the definition of same value zero instead of doing the, the key sorting approach? That's that's the same key uh, thing that. Uh, oh, sorry, was... sorry, sorry. I got confused. I'll, uh, I'll I'll add a, a footnote to that so that it's uh, it's it's clear that they're related. Um, another topic was guards. And uh, I think that those are the topics that we wanted Daniel present for. Um, the, uh, of course, our relationship with the security TG remains an open, uh, open conversation. Uh, what um, the, the the scheduling relationship I think uh, got settled, which is yeah. uh, the security TG will be using the same time slot, so that the people who are attending this don't have um, you know, more meeting burden on the security PGs. Yeah, so, do we have do we have consensus on that from the other people who wish to participate in, in the task group? I know that we have consensus among us. Uh, the, the those people were included in the uh, queries, and uh, we got no dissent. So I would say yes, we have consensus on that. Cool. Um, all right. So let the let the record reflect. Uh, <laughs> um, all right. Uh, all right. So the topics are ergonomic brand checks, same key, um, reified name, our records and tuples objects, and guards. Daniel, is there anything among those that you would like to front load today? Uh, no. Uh, which whichever one people are, are interested in starting with. All right, cool. Um, uh, let, me, let me suggest that our records and tuples and same key should be discussed together. Okay. Um, do we have, uh, is anybody prepared to talk about guards? Uh, I am though in the future I may have a more comprehensible write-up. I don't have anything really written up right now. So okay. that we decided to deprioritize it because of that. Okay, and um, uh, uh, I can speak to some degree about the, um, the historical guards and trademarks proposal, uh, but it's a long time ago, so my memory on it might be rusty. Uh, Daniel, having actually looked at the old proposal recently, probably has a better memory of that one as well. Yeah, I also think we should see if we can bring in TypeScript people for the guard discussion. So I think they would have interesting thoughts. That would be good, yeah. Oh, and we should also, um, uh, we should also try to get Waldemar to uh, come in on the guard discussion as you know, he, he and I were the original champions of the uh, old guards and trademarks, great guards and trademarks. 
Uh, okay, uh, so I think that we have um, material for same key uh, and records and tuples as objects as, a, as an aggregate topic. Uh, ergonomic brand checks, do we have material that we could uh, talk about today? Uh, so did I send to this group previously the private.name gist? Because that was sort of my thought on where we could go with ergonomic brand checks, that or something fancier with guards. I do not remember a private dot name just now. Okay. Um, I can share it in the in the chat, but probably better if I share it ahead of the meeting so people can review it beforehand. Okay. okay. The fact that you're saying private dot name makes me suspect that this also has to do with reified names. Yes. Okay, so let's consider those two topics bundled together as well. Okay, I'm, uh, I'm gonna leave a hole for Daniel to add a link to the minutes. Um, uh, so we have some homework for future meeting and I'll, uh, we can put it on a subsequent agenda whenever uh, on, on a week, Daniel, you're available. Um, so we can talk about that. The, uh, let's see. Um, so, and then uh, ergonomic brand checks, private name, that, that you said that that's related to reified name. So my idea is that we could use reified private names to as the basis for ergonomic brand checks. I shared this with Jordan, though, and he was interested more in if we could find a way that wouldn't require that the name be so sort of so much less powerful. However, the uh, I thought that the requirements for this group would, would require that the name be less powerful. So that's sort of the, the cool. key design discussion, I think. Um, and for that, ideally, we could send a message to Jordan and see if he is interested in joining this conversation with us. Cool. All right. Well, that whittles it down to the topic of our records and tuples objects and particular um, the uh, semantics of same key versus same value zero. Um, does, uh, uh, we have, we have some, uh, some faces we don't rarely see in this meeting. Are there any topics that folks on the call would like to visit today that were not yet mentioned on uh, for our agenda or in a future meeting for that matter. Cool. All right. Um, my intention is to write up a topic for a future meeting on um, the uh, where we are with the compartment shim implementation relative to the uh, XS shim implementation or XS implementation, not SHIM, um, and uh, where, where we might uh, have some gaps that we can close on, on both sides. Um, and of course, issues that, uh, of, of, uh, that would require breaking changes on both uh, if, uh, if any of them are entertainable. Um, but since I didn't finish a presentation slide deck for that today, uh, we'll bring that up later. All right, um, Mark, Daniel, uh, let's, uh, let's talk about records and records and tuples. Uh, so I'm happy that we have the, the co-champions of the proposal here, Rick and, and Robin. Um, and I'm not sure if um, Nicolo might also be here. Yeah, so um, we should start by recapping the, the conversation from the previous meeting. So there were, there were a number of sort of pros and cons that we talked about for objects versus uh, objects versus um, primitives. The thing is that the original arguments have maybe uh, diminished in importance. One of the original arguments was uh, for objects was sort of implementation complexity, though Nicola has found that it's kind of a wash for implementation complexity. Another one of the arguments was permitting a box type to be nested, though in earlier conversations in this group, I believe we've roughly concluded that um, maybe we can expect that membranes will do a sort of deep search of the record or tuple to find uh, 
specifically on the paths leading to a box, as long as there's an efficient query to, to deeply query that, because you would have to do the same thing on a on an object anyway, if you have a membrane over it because of the proxy integrity constraints. So therefore, box with this, if we have this deep query to check if a box is included uh, or accessible, box may be acceptable for either primitives or for objects, either one of those choices for records and tuples. Uh, then we had some kind of more forward looking arguments one being that if we want something like temporal or decimal to be um, based on the data model of records and tuples, the choice of primitive versus object, the big effect there is whether it's that value that points to its prototype or whether it's a per realm registry and these values are realm independent. Uh, is this an accurate summary of where we are in the current sort of discussion? Uh, there's some elaborations I, I would add to that, which is uh, the box is, um, you know, relevant if we're starting with the design point of uh, records and tuples being uh, primitives. Uh, if we're starting with the design point, which I've, I've come to prefer, uh, that they're uh, objects without identity, um, uh, that they're shallowly frozen and shallowly without identity, but they can simply contain um, uh, normal objects with identity uh, and with mutability, um, uh, then there's no need for a box top. They can just contain stuff. Uh, and then with regard to the, uh, the path query, uh, I think a adequate way to do that is that, that fits with our previous discussions uh, is to do the query on the other side, so to speak, which is, uh, is this um, uh, shallowly uh, uh, identity-free object uh, actually deeply identity-free? Um, and if it's uh, deeply identity-free, uh, then you know you can pass it through without having to do further walking. Uh, so that way you can, uh, as you walk a mixed uh, tree, you can filter out the subtrees that you can pass through without worry and uh, only uh, uh, proceed to do the membraning and rewrapping of the, um, of the parts of the mixed tree that, that lead to something in here. Yeah, I completely agree about the second point. About the first point about the uh, use of the box um, constructor explicitly, I want to posit that that's orthogonal to the primitive versus object identity list object question. The reason I think it's orthogonal is because that query function that you just explained, uh, the, the one where you check whether the shallowly identity free object is deeply identity free would sort of work just as well to detect if the, if the primitive you know, sort of directly contains an object. On the other hand, I think for either formulation, primitive or object, there is sort of qualitative ergonomic benefit to requiring an explicit uh, opt out of the default deep uh, identity listness and deep immutability. This is not a, a categorical change in semantics, but sort of a, um, it's a more subtle one. So I think I think this is something for us to discuss further, but that it's di that it's disconnected from the object versus primitive. Okay. Well, let's so um, so just uh, since uh, since the the uh, perspective I have on at the moment is the object one. Um, uh, within that world, could you explain what the motivation would be for introducing a box? Uh, can I defer to the champion group for records um, and tuples? Or any of the, the three people telling you? Um, yeah. Oh, Robin, did you want to? Are you muted? Oh, I can't hear you now. Um, I can take it, though. Um, so the one of the major design goals of Record and Tuple is that um, we avoid this kind of, um, I guess, sharp edge that we find with like traditional user land immutable data structures libraries um, around accidentally including mutable state. 
So if you imagine a world in which uh, record and tuple are uh, identityless objects, and they just simply allow you to place any object on it as a value of a record or an element in a tuple, uh, you lose that. So our idea with Box is that it maintains that record literals themselves um, and records by construction via the record constructor um, are immutable by default all the way down and that you have to opt into this behavior. Like the, the, the I view the fact that you have to dereference a box as a selling point because it means that you have to opt into that fact and you can't accidentally like follow a tree that is secretly immutable. You must opt into the fact that it's mutable. So let, let me, uh, so so I think I think I understood that good. Um, so uh, um, and the it, the the box that you guys are proposing, unlike the uh, symbol, uh, is one where uh, all you need is the box to unwrap the box, and therefore when you use a box, you actually are including uh, immutability directly. It's just that, so so the motivation is just to be explicit. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, so let me give you the the case that the, that I find motivating that becomes uh, at least awkward uh, and depending on your criteria impossible uh, uh, if there needs to be an explicit box there. One of the things that I would now like to do, starting from the design point of um, uh, these being object like uh, and uh, with the uh, same key the extended same key proposal, uh, is to integrate this in with the read-only collections proposal. So that when you take a collection and you take a snapshot of it, that the resulting snapshot collection is a shallowly immutable form of the original collection. If it's, let's say, a map, uh, um, the, um, uh, the, the map would compare with, with other such snapshot of maps using same key, which is you know, where the same key thing comes in. Uh, but the key thing is that uh, uh, the lookup behavior of it would still be like the map that it was a snapshot of. So when you do a get on a key of the snapshot of map, uh, you, get, you get the value that was the value of the original map at the time you did the snapshot, you don't get a box around the value. Um, so the smooth interoperation uh, with the three um, read-only collection operations, um, snapshot, diverge, and read-only, uh, works smoothly uh, if once you get beyond the shallow layer, you just have the same objects in either case. This applies to the keys as well. Uh, is if a key in the original collection was an identity-based object, then the snapshot collection would, the, would, still, would still have whatever that key was at the time that the snapshot was done. So can you hear me? Yes. Oh, good. So I fixed that. Um, I, I think while, while hearing you talk, I, I think there is potentially a generalization of concept here that we, we can try to do. And for us, it seems interesting to have an identity-based object that is also deep. So it's, the, the shallowness of it is kind of an issue for us. But that being said, um, there is always, a, like, there, there should be a way to also uh, store uh, so the box is is that kind of thing, right? But let's say that we also have the concept of identityless object applied to read-only collections. Read-only collections could also behave as box boundaries the same way. So if if we were basically to say that an identityless deep object is able to have inside um, shallow identityless objects, maybe using that model, and again, it, I'm sorry if this is very blurry, uh, my explanation right now, because I just came up, uh, could basically imagine a boundary such as this. Would that box be possible in that way, just saying that the box is an identityless shallow object? Or, yeah. 
So I, so I, I, I don't understand. Let me ask some questions. Yeah. Okay. Um, so uh, if something is shallowly identityless, let's say a box, and if there's, and by shallow we mean that it contains objects with identity or mm -hmm. identity mutability, um, uh, then since it contains identity and mutability, I would say that anything yeah. that contains the box cannot be considered deeply identity free just by definition. Yeah. Yes, I agree with that. So it's it's kind of cheating, like what, what I'm proposing here. Right? Let's be clear. I, uh, but yeah. Uh, I have a quick question. I'm a little confused as to what <laughs> you're suggesting, uh, Mark. So are you trying to reason about the way in which a read-only collection would fit inside of record and tuple? Or are you trying to reason about like our... So I guess what we're suggesting is that um, the that there's like this weird, I don't want to say invariant because invariant sounds like we've come to consensus on it, but like this weird idea that an identityless object can only become, you can only craft an identityless object that has internal mutable state like or points to mutable state via a box that you would also need boxes for read only collection. Is that what you're saying? And because you don't want to break that supposed invariant yeah, the, the I mean, the, first of all, let me let me uh, endorse you know, using the term invariant to talk about hypotheticals. Um, you know, to um, um, but yeah, the um, let's let's take a let's take a more direct example. Um, yeah, uh, since the proposal does have tuples, and since tuples are sort of like a snapshotted array. Uh, except for the fact that arrays in JavaScript are so bizarre, you know, with holes and all sorts of crazy things. Uh, let's imagine that um, we had something that was um, uh, a more principled mutable array-like thing uh, so that maybe fits in the, you know, just, just you know, spinning fantasy here. I haven't examined this in any detail. But something that fits in the typed array hierarchy in the sense that it's uh, you know, no holes, uh, all of the um, the in the indexed things uh, are between zero and, and and length minus one. They all have the same um, you know uh, property attributes, etc. Just something that's well behaved but can contain objects rather than um, uh, uh, just containing primitive values. Um, uh, the, it, it would be attractive to be able to extend the read-only collection um, methods, the three methods, um, uh, um, a snapshot, uh, read-only, and diverge uh, to um, convert back and forth between uh, tuples and some kind of um, uh, principled uh, let's, uh, you know, principled uh, array, um, and uh, and as a uh, I, as a array-like thing that has identity um, and that is mutable, you would certainly find it natural to store objects uh, in the elements directly. Um, and then, if you if we allow a snapshot of that to create a tuple and a diverge on the tuple to create such a principled array, uh, then the same issue comes up. Uh, the reason I was bringing that, so now with that, with that example clear, let me, I can go back to uh, what I was thinking about with regard to maps, which is um, uh, uh, I was thinking that maps themselves, uh, this, is, this is where sort of the whole same key generalization comes in, that maps themselves um, uh, that a, snap, a map snapshot would be shallowly, would itself be shallowly identity free and shallowly immutable in the same way that records and tuples are shallowly identity free and shallowly immutable. Um, uh, and that uh, the resolution of the whole, um, uh, you know, and, and at that point, when, you, when the keys can be arbitrary objects, uh, the, we have to find another solution to the old 
um, uh, can symbols be keys? Um, uh, you know, can symbols be, pro be property names of records? Because clearly, uh, arbitrary objects can be keys and maps. So, um, uh, so any and any solution that works for arbitrary objects being keys and maps will necessarily work for symbols uh, being property names of records. So uh, the proposal there uh, is that um, the um, that we generalize uh, uh, same value zero into same key, where for all of the existing data types in the language, same value zero and same key always do exactly the same thing. Um, uh, for strings and symbols, um, uh, uh, same value zero does the same thing as same. So for strings and symbols, it's already consistent with um, uh, looking up of uh, property names on both objects and records. Um, and then, um, uh, and then uh, the, the uh, new thing would be that same key compares records order independently. So it is um, an equivalence class, uh, unlike triple equal, uh, triple equals not an equivalence class because of the behavior on NAN. Um, like same value zero, it's an equivalence class that's less precise than object is. Um, and then the idea would be that for all of the existing collections where they currently compare on same value zero, we just specify them as comparing on same key that can't change any legacy behavior because they're the same for all legacy data types. But what that means is that when you store two records, um, when, you, when you store a record with one order uh, into a map, and then you look up a record with a different order that's the same except for the order difference, that you still get a successful map order. Um, uh, and then, uh, finally, the whole thing folds in on itself by saying that a snapshotted map uh, is itself something that compares in a order independent manner uh, with regard to other snapshotted maps um, using same key. So you can use a snapshotted map as a key in a map uh, and then it's recursively uh, order independent on the comparison. Gotcha. Okay. So the same key stuff makes sense. Um, that tracks with my understanding of it so far. Um, and the thing that you highlighted, the, the, uh, the first point, first part of your point is the part that I was missing that when you want to convert between some kind of like read only uh, or sorry, like mutable map in your read-only collections proposal to um, an identityless version that that obviously is incompatible with some kind of explicit box requirement because then like they don't come out as they come out as box. Like if you were going to, for example, suggest that the boxes get implicitly wrapped or the keys and values get implicitly wrapped into boxes, that's a problem. If those boxes like are not transparent because you have to call a DREF on them. That causes a lot of problems. That doesn't make any sense. That that makes sense to me. Um, I want to disagree with that. Yeah. Because, uh, well, you know, the, the idea that I proposed in the gist was that the box be required sort of on the way in, and then it would get unwrapped afterward. So it still would work to have this sort of snapshot uh, return something where you, you don't have to do DREF, but when you create a literal or when you use the map method, you would still have to create a box, something like that. Uh, okay, I understood the literal. What, which map method did you mean? Like tuple prototype map, if you, but that's, the, you know, that's a case that we could make a separate decision for. I think Robin wanted to say something. Yeah, uh, can we just go back to your proposition, Mark? And if I understand well, uh, I'm not sure. So, can I try uh, re-saying it with my own words and and see if if, if we agree? Um, 
And do we actually, in that model, uh, have records in tuple be actually shallow identity-less objects? Uh, in which case, I'd like to understand uh, what kind of equality we would deal with in, in, in that in that model. Okay. So, um, uh, so uh, uh, basically, there's two equality operations uh, that we would still support. Uh, we would still support object dot is. Uh, which has the same invariant that it has now, which is um, uh, two things are object that is equivalent if they're observably equivalent in all ways, if there's no observable difference. So two records that have the, that, that um, uh, would compare the same with same key, but which would enumerate their, their properties in different orders would not be object that is. Uh, the, the reason why um, uh, this doesn't create the problem that we were originally worried about uh, is that none of the existing collections uh, do a lookup according to object that is. They all do the lookup according to same value zero, which we're generalizing the same key. Uh, but we would have uh, both equality operations. Uh, there is there's a further ergonomic issue uh, which I'll, I'll just punt on because it's not uh, something I have a strong opinion about, but uh, what we associate with triple equals. Triple equal uh, is not an equivalence class. Um, uh, uh, we have um, uh, triple equal uh, 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 for the cases in which it is an equivalence class um, uh, agrees with same value zero. So probably uh, the right generalization of triple equal is that except for direct NAND comparison, uh, it's otherwise just an alias for same key. So basically it says, if both my operands are NAND, then I do the triple equal thing of saying no, and otherwise I just do the same key thing. I suppose, I'm sorry, if either of my operands is NAND, then I do the no, otherwise I do the same key thing. Okay, okay. I, I will need more time to wrap my head around this, but this, okay. Um, so um, if we wanted to bounce, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt Robin. If we wanted to bounce back to the other thing yeah, we were talking about, um, about Dan's suggestion about unwrapping on the way in. I don't know if you were uh, considering that, Mark. Um, uh, so uh, I hadn't thought about it before. Uh, for, for the literal case, I, can, I see the explicit disadvantage. Um, uh, and, it, and, and the literal case, it's really, in some sense, just a syntactic thing. Um, the, the, as I understand, the unwrapping on the way in, the collection being made uh, still has no boxes in the collection. Um, uh, so in the, in the literal case, this makes perfect sense to me. Um, uh, in the computed cases, I'm sorry, it makes perfect sense to me. I still don't know whether it's attractive, um, uh, but uh, it's, it has little semantic effect because it's just a syntactic effect. Um, uh, for the API cases, I just don't have my head wrapped around it. I will say that just previous experience in, in E, uh, where we had uh, the taxonomy, the whole auditor taxonomy, that have you guys seen the 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 auditor taxonomy thing that I that I um, uh, uh, shared? This is the object taxonomy with deep freeze. Um, yeah, that stuff. Yeah, yeah, we have, or at least I have. Okay, and I see uh, Robin shaking his head as well. I know Daniel has. Um, so in any case, uh, in E, which is where a lot of my intuitions about this come from, um, uh, we didn't have anything like a need to box to nest these things in each other. But um, the literal syntax, the, the straightforward literal syntax, where in JavaScript we would just write uh, square brackets or curly brackets, uh, the corresponding straightforward literal syntax in E made what we're, not, what we're calling here records and tuples. Um, uh, and also made um, 
identity-free, shallowly identity-free maps. So the direct literal syntax only made the shallow identity-free things. Um, uh, so therefore, there was no nested literals that would escape back to mutability. It had to be that you were escaping back to mutability by including variables, or you know, by including computed expressions, by including something other than just uh, syntactic literals all the way down. Uh, and with that invariant, uh, I never found myself further confused about when I was dealing with something that was shallowly mutable versus some, I was dealing with something that had identity. Okay. So, we, so we've decided kind of in committee that we don't want to go with this uh, differentiating variables from nested literals with the concern that Valdemar raised, where basically he said, this thing in particular you shouldn't do. I agree. I, I, I agree. I'm, I'm, I'm mentioning that not because it is a conclusive argument for anything in particular, but just sort of as, as background on um, intuitions from a different language. So overall, this gives you the intuition that requiring this box thing is plausible for literals, even if we can't determine now whether we want to go with it? I think either way is still plausible that that example from E can, is kind of a partial argument for both sides of the question. Um, so I wasn't really raising it to to even try to sway the argument one side or the other, but just to give, give a sense of um, how these things can feel given a different set of decisions. So I don't know, the, in, the, in the literal case, uh, having a syntactic uh, escape to get back to mutability um, uh, is something that I, I think is plausible and I think not doing that is also, I don't, I don't feel convinced one way or the other. Yeah, I'm a little bit squeamish um, by the idea of some kind of syntactic escape, um, only because, well, I guess, uh, not just only, especially um, considering the way people will map over tuples, map over object records, and the whole point of um, making this like escape hatch explicit is to um, make it unambiguous in all cases, uh, so that you don't, so that you never make the mistake. And if you can map over a tuple and accidentally return an array from the map function or an like an object, that would be bad. Um, yeah, I'm not quite sure. Okay, I, I yeah, we, we, we so, sorry. Go, go ahead. Uh, yeah, no. One of the motivations behind like being explicit, being having like to do something to dereference or to even put a mutable object in, in the in the records and tuple structure is, is by discussions that we've been having with other engineers colleagues uh, that actually have been using libraries such as immutable JS and ending up with something that is mutable in their hands and have someone else that's not completely aware of those data structures do something you know, like changing something or, or, or even not trusting the equality altogether, which is one of the issues we're trying to actually squash with this proposal. Um, so, so that's why we're kind, uh, we would like to have this property somehow at, at some point. Um, um, yeah, yeah that, I mean, so but, I, I guess my, I'm oh, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off at the very end. Our the timing didn't work. Um, it's fine. The, I guess the way I'm thinking about this is that it's it like we're these two different categories of features need two different things, right? So um, I don't think it would be unre. I need to think about it a lot more, but I don't think it would be unreasonable to state that um, the invariant that uh, that mutable objects first be mapped into a boxed or identity full objects are put into a box before reaching an identity list object um, must exist and that it isn't simply a special case for record and tuple in general that like we that 
Um, this also tracks with like temporal and um, temporal's need for like internal slots for their calendars. Those are immutable, I assume. Um, but they would, if they were identityless objects, you would need to store them. Um, but you don't want to like have to deal with boxes around that edge. So I guess my point is that it's it sounds like generalizing this box with regard to identityless objects doesn't sound like the right solution. At least I need to think about if it's not the right solution. And instead, the box is simply a feature for record and tuple. So when when we discussed this in the past, Garrity, who doesn't seem to be here, and Bradley were, were raising some significant concerns about making box kind of implicit or transparent in these kinds of scenarios. Bradley, Bradley do you have any thoughts? Uh, oh. To whom was that just directed? Uh, maybe I'm misremembering, and maybe the thoughts were coming more from Carity, but uh, when we were talking about, for example, having a prototype, which is in a, in a, not in records and tuples, which we could say are fixed to a null prototype, but for other identityless objects, having a mutable prototype, there were some concerns raised about that because of the, you know, breaking these kind of integrity guarantees. Um, I kind of feel like if, if we say that it's things that are not records and tuples that we're allowing the mutable not that the prototype internal slot would be mutable, but that it would point to a mutable prototype. Uh, that it would point to a mutable identity full object. Then um, I feel like for things that are not records and tuples, this might not break integrity uh, properties because the integrity is sort of conceived of as over the domain where the domain of a record and tuple would be all property keys in the domain of, or all string property keys in the domain of say temporal object uh, would really be more about its internal slots because it has no own properties. And if we made it identity list, then presumably it would be frozen that way. Um, so so uh, just to clarify, uh, the majority of the concern was about those domains as you're calling them and what is actually enforced. I don't think we have any way to clearly state uh, what integrity is for other kinds of types, but for records and tuples, we are actually just trying to preserve those integrity domains. We're not so concerned about other things. Um, for, let's say, temporal, was an identityless object somehow for uh, a thought experiment. Um, it seems to me, at least personally, that it would be the job of the temporal uh, type to create its own sort of integrity domain. You can already see this with a few existing types in JavaScript, like how strings uh, actually have a dot length and index properties that are own properties if you create wrapper objects around them. So they won't actually face any integrity problems from the prototype. And you can actually use the full expected amount of string properties uh, and recreate whatever algorithm you need based upon that. So I don't think we're objecting to value types or whatever we want to call these identity list types. Uh, having mutable things, we're merely objecting to specific problems uh, due to uh, the integrity domains, particularly for records and tuples being much larger than the expected domains of other types. That makes a lot of sense to me and seems to point to this sort of potentially productive path of um, boxes are, I guess, on, on the way in, in air quotes, for records and tuples, records always have null prototypes, and other kinds of identityless objects may have uh, pointers to identity full objects in a direct way if it makes sense given its integrity domain. Okay. Does that um, yeah. good. correctly summarize where we were kind of at in thinking about this? 
Yeah, that's what that's exactly what I mean. In that yeah, the, 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 ultimately, the record and tuple proposal just wouldn't take a position on the constraints required for getting this object. Okay. Yeah, I mean that I is also the that is also the idea that I was trying to express earlier. So so that that but better explained. So thanks. So so something that's very nice about uh, this this place to draw the line uh, is that only records and tuples have a literal syntax anyway. Um, uh, snapshotted maps, snapshotted sets, uh, anything else um, uh, that, you know, like that that we create, uh, since, it's, since there's no corresponding literal syntax for the mutable form in the language right now, there would also be no literal form uh, for the uh, identity free version. Uh, they would only be constructed by API. So I, I, th I think this is a nice place to draw the line. Okay. Yeah, I, I think I need to give this a little bit more thought, but I think what we should do in response to this, I think this is a really productive path for this. Uh, it seems to resolve some concerns. Um, I think we, sh we can do a write-up of this in more detail and um, kind of see if it plays out the way we think it will while we do that and then come um, send it around see and get some more detailed thoughts. Does that sound right to you, Dan? Uh, yes, I guess we have two different things to consider writing up. One is this, uh, the evolution of the identityless object idea. And the other thing is the, um, the idea about comparing keys, which could help us take into account uh, deeply immutable maps being compared in an order free way by by the triple equals comparison do are there any were there any concerns that we had about that that latter one which would include the, the generalization of records and tuple record keys to symbols i'm so i i'm i don't have a strong opinion on whether we um define equality between these identity objects as the same key versus like some more strict guarantee of like it's never observable whether the keys are in a certain order or something. But I don't actually know what the background is on why same key would be chosen over something like the keys are sorted on the way in, like the original proposal. Well, um, so I don't know how that conflicts with map, I guess. So, so, the, um, so the, 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 the problem we ran into uh, uh, before uh, we started thinking about shallow, shallow the identity free maps for, um, or snapshot of maps, uh, is that um, what do you do about unregistered symbols? Uh, unregistered symbols can't be sorted. Um, and you know, we were taking a hard line of prohibiting them. I was, I was one of the advocates of that hard line. Um, uh, but this um, uh, less precise equivalence class I think makes that issue go away uh, and accommodates arbitrary objects as keys, which is necessary for the shallow map. Um, uh, the, uh, because triple equal um, is already imprecise in the same way that same value zero is imprecise, i.e. between zero and minus zero, and it just has this bizarre anomaly on man, uh, I, I, I do think that in the interest of um, uh, uh, tamping down the explosion of concepts, that having a triple equal be uh, basically uh, is either operand and nan, do the triple equal thing, otherwise do the same key thing, uh, is, is I think the uh, least unpleasant way to view the triple equal. And I have okay. no opinion at all on double equal. I can't even think about double equal without my brain hurting. We don't. We, we try not to. So this is a double equal free zone here. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> May I um, ask uh, a member of this conversation to volunteer to write a resolution down in our minutes uh, that that captures uh, what we've what we've discovered from this conversation? whomever has the, the, the best concrete vision of it. And we can review it next week to make sure that we're on the same page. Um, yeah. I don't know if I have the best vision, but I do have free time. So that's good enough, right? <laughs> that's, that is good enough. <laughs> okay. That is, that is good enough. <laughs> um, thank you. Okay. 
So this makes sense. I, I, I didn't consider, obviously, that maps need that kind of order. So it doesn't, um, I guess this is a devil's, not, it's not quite a devil's advocate because nobody's advocating against me. Um, but this is a thought of um, if we, I guess the option exists to us if we think that the um, original like quality of the integrity of um, like the keys and so their sorted order of record people was valuable, we could either sort them anyway um, in the same way that we would unbox things implicitly anyway in record and tuple and in, in that like take an opinion on that route um, or we could do something more explicit um, this would also if we didn't do that the other option it also enables us to use record or symbols as keys and records because they would no longer be um, like we would no longer have to sort them um, I'll, I'll include both of those considerations in the eventual write up we do on this I don't really have a strong opinion either way um, if any of the status quo is fine, just something to mention. So just, just a qualifier on that, once we allow unregistered symbols as keys, uh, we can't canonically sort them. Uh, so what we're talking about is kind of a, a, a compromised partial sort, sort when we can't. Right, like one precludes the other. If we went with the same key solution for recommend tuple, uh, or if we didn't go with that, then we can't have symbols as keys. Then uh -huh. unregistered symbols as keys. Yeah, I don't, I'll, I'll try to make that clear. Okay. Yeah. It, it's, it's nice that we can still have fast lookups with mostly collision free hash tables, but uh, um, yeah, there would be some, some collisions. <laughs> yeah, for, for example, um, non equivalent symbols that have the same description. Right. Right. For, um, uh, for shallow maps, for you know, shallowly immutable maps, um, uh, what I think is natural there uh, is to uh, preserve the enumeration order uh, of the map being snapshot. Uh, and um, yeah, so we're at just past time um, for me to turn off the recording. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and do that.